we're going to sing Redeem next. I just want you to think about something. I heard something on the radio the other day, and I haven't really thought about it, but the blessings that we have during COVID. Some churches, some cities aren't even allowing singing in the church because singing can spread, you know, if you're too close. So I was like, we're blessed because we're singing, and, you know, I think God will protect us if we're lifting up his name. But still, that's just some, one more thing to be thankful for during all this mess. If we can thank him during the mess, then we see it on the other side as a, as a great uh, time of trial and purification and blessing. So let's stand and sing Redeem, because that's what we've all been redeemed. If we can.
Brandon had shared, he actually shared it on his Facebook, so some of you may have seen it, but he had shared a story with me this week about a fellow that he saw at work who was sharing his testimony with him, and he said, you know, I know a lot of people consider themselves to, you know, they, they try to, when people say, what's your story like, they, they say, well, you know, I liken myself to a Peter or a Paul or maybe even a Jonah or whatever. And he said, man, I, I'll be honest with you, I'm James. And Brandon said, do what? He said, I'm James, man. I, I'll just tell you, my life story is the story of James, the half-brother of Jesus. <laughs> Brandon said, okay, well, tell me about that. And he said the guy got passionate, emotional, he said, man, let me tell you, I grew up <clears throat> knowing my parents took me to church, taught me, my grandparents, my, my whole life. I knew everything I needed to know about who Jesus was, what Jesus has done, what Jesus can do. As far as what the knowledge was in my head, I had it. The relationship with my heart just wasn't there. I believe you said seven years ago, Brandon? Was it seven? Nine. Nine years ago. Nine years ago, I got radically saved. And I came to know and accept Jesus Christ for who He really is, my Savior, my Lord and Savior. And He has changed my life. And since then, I have spent my life trying to explain to people what a difference Jesus can make when you actually know it that way. And he said, I believe that's much like James, the half-brother of Jesus who grew up living with him and seeing him and knowing him and, and, and knowing all. And, but man, it was so much later in the, in the life and in their history together when James actually was able to realize and accept become a part of sharing the gospel. This man said, that's, that's who I consider myself like. I, I had it sitting there in front of me for years and I just didn't take advantage of what I had. As I thought through that and as we, you know, we, we often when we don't have, you know, when we're not in the middle of a book and we don't know exactly where we're going and how we're going to get there and so forth and so on. It just inspired me to go back and start reading a little bit about James. So today, we're going to be in the first chapter of the book that this man James wrote. The title. As I have it on my paper, I didn't want to take quite as much time but to put it up there. You've got up there, trials and tribulations of blessing in disguise. What I have here is, how can these trials and tribulations help me? So pose that question to yourself as you, those of you that take notes, write that on there. How can these trials and tribulations help me. Anybody feel like we're going through a, a season of trials or a season of tribulation or a season of chaos or I don't know what words you want to put there, but I think they all pretty much fit right now. I mean, our, our world is in unrest. Our world is at a lack of peace. Our world is, quite honestly, is as crazy as we've ever seen it in most of our lifetime as a whole. Just this week, you know, when I'm looking at trials and tribulations and the way that the world is going right now and what all everybody is having to deal with, just this week alone, I've dealt with people, worked with people, and I've worked on people that are having a wedding this coming weekend. 
We've got a funeral, of course, Monday uh, for Miss Doris. Obviously, these two Sunday morning services, working on trying to prepare something for all of us to have relevant, inform revel, revel, relevant information. There were several folks who are dealing with dementia in the midst of all of this. And their families, multiple folks who have had diagnoses of illness. Two ladies who are leaving their homes, long time homes, to move in or close to their kids. I've talked with several strangers about how drawing lines in the sand and being extremists in today's culture has cut off conversations of compromise in the world today. You say, well, how is all of that? I mean, some of that is just your normal words. Yeah, but see, when I dealt with that family about the funeral, we're talking about things that we've never talked about when we deal with funerals. We're talking about graveside only, and we're talking about making an announcement for social distancing, and we're talking about the fact that Ms. Doris's own brothers and sisters, some of them probably won't attend because of their age or because of the susceptibility to the to the airborne sickness if it's there and so forth and so on. Brother, one of the brothers. Gary told me he hasn't even been to the grocery store and he's ordered his groceries in for the duration since March. But what about the wedding? That's a joyous time. Yeah, we're talking about a wedding with folks that probably would have had a, you know, a huge wedding and invited a lot of people instead. It's primarily going to be a family-only affair. See, everybody's dealing with trials and truth. Everything is different right now. Everybody's having to deal with it. <clears throat> everybody's having to work through this. Everybody's having to try to figure out. We've actually looked at James before, and when I look back, I actually saw where we had. I'm not going to lie to you, we're going to rerun an outline. But the outline is great. But I'm going to change the illustrations and make them for today. We're going to talk about things in today's environment. Look at verses 1 through 4 with me as we start today. I'm in the New King James. James chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. It says, James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. What do you have going on in your life right now that you would consider a trial or a tribulation? How much anger, frustration, bitterness joy has it actually taken from you today? James says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Why? Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. How is it that we are to find 
joy and tribulation. How is it that these trials and these tribulations can help me? <laughs> because they normally get me down, if I'm honest. The first way that James shares with us here is that if I look to God and if I focus on His Word, Focus on what God is going to do in and through these trials and tribulations for me. I, point number one, I will develop patience. I will develop patience. The Greek word here for patience can be translated as endurance. It's a character trait that we all need, even when we're not in trials and tribulations, even when we're not suffering, we still need this character trait. We need patience. We need to be patient at work. We need to be patient at home. We need to be patient at school. We need to be patient for God to lead in the direction that God would have us to go in every facet of our lives. Endurance. Perseverance. You guys have watched the kids grow up. The older two have done the whole younger brother trying to catch older brother and trying to beat him at something and all that kind of thing. And then Brett, as he grew up, he wanted to compete, play with the older two. And so he, he would get in there and rough house and try to go outside and play basketball with him and do his thing. But, but then Chase, Chase is down here. He's only in the seventh grade. Drew's getting ready to go to college, and Chase is in the seventh grade right now. Chase has always been a whole lot smaller. Brett seemed to grow a little faster. I mean, Brett, if you haven't seen Brett lately, Brett shot up this summer. He's, he's working out for football. He's trimmed down a little bit. So he's, he's, uh, uh, he's able to hold his own with But Chase, Chase is still a true blue middle schooler. He hadn't quite hit that growth spurt. It's hard for him to hold his own with so Chase just never has really stuck his nose up in there because he didn't want to get it knocked off, you know? He was just kind of kind of careful with that whole situation. But this year, Mom, Chase was like, I don't know if I really want to do baseball this year, Mom. You know, it's that, that whole, hey, everybody else did it, but I, I just, I'm just really not into it kind of thing. And Mom said, that's fine, Chase, but you're not going to sit at home on the couch and watch TV, so find something to do. And so I thought the boy was crazy, but somehow his mama talked to him into running cross country. <laughs> He's going to run. I, I didn't discourage him. If you want to run, go run, man. I run when there's a bear chasing me. <laughs> so far, I hadn't had to happen. <laughs> but have fun, you know. And he's been running all summer. Now, when he first went out there, I'm going to tell you what. He probably walked a lot more than he ran. Yesterday, was yesterday, Friday, yesterday, yesterday. I went out there and he'd gone out to run. And the boys, Drew and Austin and I were actually under the carport doing some stuff, working on a little something. I saw him out there. He comes out here and he runs around the church. They've got him mapped out how many laps is a mile and all that good stuff out here around the cemetery, around the church and all. So his mama walks and he runs. And so I look out here and he's, he's going at it. And we were out there for a while doing whatever we were doing. We went back in and still no chase. The chase is still over here. So he finally comes back in and he said, dude, how far did you run today? He gave me the check, Crawford answered. He said, oh, today I did eight miles. He said, eight miles? 
I didn't drive eight miles yesterday. You know? When he first started this summer, there's no way he could have come out here and, and run eight miles. But he's been working all summer and building his perseverance up, his endurance up. And now he can come out here and he can do that. Now, I'm not saying he's ready to run the Olympics, but I ain't coming out here and walking eight miles, much less running. I don't have that endurance. I don't have that perseverance. My heart would probably explode. But Chase did it yesterday. Guys, when it says that he will give us patience, he's talking about giving us endurance for life. He's talking about helping us to be able to handle all of the adversities, all of the trials, all of the tribulations, all of the craziness of life. And he's saying, hey, look, you've got to exercise in order to be able to do this. You can't just, you can't just sit at home, watch TV, live how you want to, do what you want to, never study the Bible, never go to church, never do, never work on your patience, never work on endurance, and then when the big thing hits, expect to be able to have patience and make it through it in a healthy way, in a Christian way, in the way that God would have it. No. You see, through the tests that God brings about, through the through the trials and through the tribulations that we have in our life, God is helping us to exercise. It's like when Chase came out and he started running those shortest. God is, God is working us out and He is working within us this great work so that we will be able to handle more and more and more throughout our life and be able to give other people good counsel, good Christian counsel in how to handle adversity and how to do things in their lives. But we have to take each and every one of them with God. We have to walk through these things with God. I already mentioned it. I believe that one of the major pitfalls, I'm not making any kind of a political statement. I, this is just, a, quite honestly, a, a moral statement. I, I think that one of the major pitfalls that we have in our society today is that when these moments come, when, when issues arise in our lives today, people are, are so quick to, to go ahead, draw a conclusion, and then immediately go to the extreme and draw their own extreme conclusion and draw a line in the sand and say, all right, this is where I'm at and I'm not going to move. This is where I'm at and I'm not going to listen. This is my position and I don't want to hear yours. This is my position, and don't you go over here and mess with me. And what it's created is it's created a society of people who don't treat one another as God's creation. People will, will isolate and, and segregate and Divide on so many different issues today. It's not just race. And the Bible does not teach segregation. The Bible teaches unification. The Bible teaches us to be one in Christ. To find common ground. We should be able to talk to people who have differences with us and find common ground in Jesus Christ. You say, well, what about those people that don't, that don't love Jesus Christ? Well, Jesus did everything He could to find common ground with those very people each and every day. Did He compromise His morals? No. Did He compromise His convictions? Absolutely not. He didn't go and sin in order to do, in order to meet them. He didn't go start fights in order to do it. Patience. I will develop patience. 
It says, My brother, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let that patience have its perfect work. That you may be perfect and complete. Lacking nothing. Point number two. I will be made perfect and complete. I will be made perfect and complete. This is not a reference to, to sinless perfection, guys. Who's the only person that's ever going to walk the face of the earth with sinless perfection? Jesus Christ. Signed, sealed, delivered, and done. We, we know that, right? And that one's not up for debate. What this is referencing is spiritual maturity. Discipleship in the Lord. To become as much like Christ as possible while on this side of heaven and absolutely 100% completely perfect when on that side of heaven. The testing of our faith leads us to a deeper communion and a greater trust in God. When we face these times, and we allow God to lead, guide, and direct. Our relationship with Him is deepened. Our trust in Him is not only uh, strengthened, but quite often it's rewarded. Amen. Think about it. The times that we trust God, and God reveals Himself to us, and He shows up, what does that do for us? It boosts our faith. We are rewarded. All of a sudden, we're like, oh man, yeah, thank you, Lord. And it's going to make it easier the next time to trust Him even more. That's what it's talking about when it's talking about us being perfected and completed spiritually. We're going to be strengthened our faith. Guys, if we can have patience and if we can count on the Lord, in the midst of these trials, God's going to answer. God's going to reveal Himself. And it will continue to produce a stable, godly, and righteous character with us. The word complete here in the Greek it's actually from a compound Greek word that literally means, literally translates, all the portions are whole. All the parts, or all the portions, if you will, are whole. That's what it means when it says, I'll be made perfect and complete. We're going to take various parts, put them together, Make something great. Make that which God intended. He's taken all these various aspects of our character, all these various strengths and talents and gifts that He's given us, and He's molding them, strengthening them, developing them, discipling us in a way so that He can put it all together for us to be the child, the follower, the agent, the worshiper of Him that He's called us to be. So that we can be made perfect and complete. Our earthly trip, our, our earthly life, if you will, is a constant preparation for our heavenly destination. I already mentioned Drew a minute ago being the oldest. 
is 18. 18. I actually shared it in here a couple years ago, maybe a year and a half ago. That at that point I had come to a really, really hard and stark realization. It hit me like a ton of bricks when it did. Now, Drew's a good kid, and I believe that Drew is the type that will always give me an opportunity to talk to him, and he will always listen. The reality is this. I got a couple more weeks, and Drew's moving out of the house, and he's going to college. The reality is this, guys. God blessed Brom and myself for 18 years to pour into Drew. Our role in his life was to prepare him for what's facing to happen in two weeks. Our God given role was to do everything we could in 18 years to prepare him, to help him be ready for the day that he steps out of that house and he has to start making real big boy life decisions Amen. on his own. You say, well, he's going to college, man. He's going to live in the dorm. It's a controlled environment. Yeah, it is. And I'm happy about that. And I'm happy he's going to be close. And I'm happy there's that little umbrella, that, that net of protection that's still there. I also remember what, I, what, what college was like when I went. And I saw plenty of people make plenty of stupid decisions that cost them drastically in life. You have 18 years to do everything you can to prepare your child. you got 18 years to look at him and see him and work with him and try to, try to have God reveal to you as a parent how to share and how to develop and how to take and how to mold and how to put all of this stuff together. And the whole time you're praying, God, man, you got to do something because I'm too stupid to do all this. And God's working and you're praying that you're doing a little bit of the right thing. And at the end of 18 years, you're praying somehow all of this worked out and the kid's ready. That's, at least that's what it was like for me. I don't know about for y'all. That's what it was like for me. And now we're going to see what happens. Guys, it's a lot like that. Our Christian life, our whole life here on earth, is God shaping, molding, working on our strengths and our talents, and working with us and trying to get us ready. Going to college is a huge step for an 18 year old. Stepping out of the house is a huge step. Being able to make decisions without having mom and dad there to see if you're home and all that because that's all of that is is big time freedom and big time stuff for an 18 year old you know what there are times when we as people we as christians we have those moments in our life as christians where it's just like becoming 18 and going to college for the first time in our christian life with Something big happens and God says, man, I've been working on you all your life to get you ready for this moment. The question is, did we do what he, what he, what he called us to do? Did we do those exercises? Did, did we practice the patience? Did we develop the way God developed us so that we could be ready, so that we could be made perfect and complete and ready for that which God and life has brought us to. And then the last phrase is the phrase that I love. Because this is the promise, guys. If we do this, as He develops patience in us, as He works in our Christian character, and He, and he, and he works to make us perfect and complete, and take all the pieces and make us whole, look at what it says. It says, lacking <coughs> nothing. Lacking nothing. You know what that promise is? I'm going to 
put it in other words so that we can understand today what it means. I will be equipped. Point number three. I will be equipped. God is constantly equipping us. Brandon, I know, has experienced this. Many of you may have experienced this. Sometimes we get it right as Christians. And sometimes we falter or fail miserably. But when we are faced with those moments of adversity, those moments where God has placed us in a place and He says, all right, here is your chance to either help somebody, your chance to counsel, your chance to uh, be a leader, your chance to do whatever. Here is your opportunity. Usually we have a choice. Scripture is pretty clear about this. We can... We can be led by our own understanding or we can be led by the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'm telling you, I've allowed it to go both ways. But when you allow yourself to be led by God, man, it's a, it's a magical spiritual moment. Amen. And it's great. And Amen. you walk away and you say, Brandon said, man, I don't know where that came from. And I say, well, you chalk it up to God. You know, you're not sitting there and you're not ready. It just happens, you know? Mm -hmm. We've talked about moments like this. I had one, I had gone to see Gary about Doris. Doris's birthday would have been yesterday. And Gary was talking to me and he said, man, he said, I really wanted Mama to make a birthday. And I'm sitting there. Gary wasn't upset. Gary's happy. Doris is not much, he knows that. She's physically, she's better than she's been in 10 years. He, he knows that. that. That wasn't what he was saying at all. But he Man, she missed her birthday by, by 23 hours. I was sitting there. And guys, I, I didn't even, honestly, I didn't even know it was her birthday until he told me. And then out of somewhere it came. I said, Gary, can you imagine? In all her life, has she ever gotten a better birthday present than she got this year? And him and Kathy both just smiled and said, that's right. Bring the Lord and help people who can. Yeah. I look back and I thank the Lord I help people. I have a former neighbor come last week and pick me up like a floor, but I'm not sure I got the floor to go up. Yep. All the way to the end and help somebody. That's right. That's right. So I, I don't have a clue what I'll say. Um, <laughs> best birthday ever. Sorry. But whatever, whatever, uh, whenever he said that, I was sitting there and I was just like, man, what do you say now, man? I mean, this guy just threw this at me. I, I had nothing. But God had something. Guys, I'm going to tell you, when you go to visit folks, you pray. You say, God, I'm going to need you. I'm going to need you to help because I do not know what I'm fixing to walk into. I don't know what's going to be said. I don't know what's going to need to be said. I don't, I don't know what's, what's about to happen. But, Lord, I'm going to need you to take care of this situation. Amen. And he did. Guys, I'm going to tell you something. When we allow God to lead God into wrath, we're equipped. It doesn't matter what adversity you've got. It doesn't matter what situation comes up in your life. It does not matter how bad the trials and the tribulations get. You will be equipped for what comes to you. You may not feel like you are. Guys, look, we've all had stuff. Brandon mentioned a prayer request while it was Sammy. But been, been diagnosed with leukemia this week. Anybody in here ready for that diagnosis? No. I'm not ready to find out this week that I got leukemia. <laughs> 
I'm not sitting here saying, boy, I hope that one comes this week. But God will prepare us for what He's got coming. Amen. If we allow it. God will help us. God will walk with us. God will work through us. And God will help us deal with whatever comes. We will be equipped. He said, but let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Guys, here's our problem. Pay attention. This is the whole, the whole morning in a nutshell. Amen. You know what happens? We get so preoccupied, focused on the trial and the tribulation that we fail to see the equipping that God has already put in place. Amen. We get so preoccupied with the adversity. We get so preoccupied with the suffering. We get so preoccupied with what's wrong that we can't take the next step and allow God to reveal to us how He's prepared us to move forward and still have joy. Amen. Allow God to speak to us today. Allow God to continue to perfect, to complete, and to show us how He has already equipped us for the adversities, the trials, and the tribulations Amen. that are coming up in our lives today. Amen. It's a strange time that we're in. And I'll be honest with you, I don't have a clue where these, where these trials and tribulations are going to stop. I don't know how bad the unrest and the distrust. I don't, I don't know. I mean, I don't think any of us can look at it right now and make any kind of a judgment as to just what all is going to take place. But I know this. Our God does. Our God knows. Amen. And there are promises in Scripture from Him saying that He'll never leave us but forsake us. From Him saying that He's got us prepared. Guys, we just got to be willing to take whatever comes next with God. Amen. Brandon, have prayer, and then I've got something to share with you. Father, we love you. We indeed thank you for <coughs> being the source of our hope in difficult times. Lord, there's not many things we're assured of in life. Um, but Lord, we are given the assurance that sufferings and trials will come. And Lord, I'm thankful that um, we can look to you to, to perfect... Um, whatever situation and use it Lord to to bring glory and honor to your name but also God to, to have an outlook a good outlook on on it for who may be watching us going through that hard time Lord I pray that as we um, continue to try to just find our way through this situation that we're in Lord that um, we look for the for the only truth the only relative truth the only source of hope and light that we have and that's you Lord we wouldn't look to um, politicians we wouldn't look to um, doctors and nurses God that uh, we, we would just look to you Lord and have our faith and trust in you Lord and that when circumstances get presented to us God that we would um, be able to just just co continually have a relationship and communication with you to help help us keep our eyes on you Lord we love you and we thank you in Jesus name we pray amen all right, so everybody hold your seat for just a minute. Uh, Mr. Scott's going to work his way up here. And uh, Scott and the deacons met with Brandon and myself this week. And uh, in, the, in the midst of what we're going through, with all of uh, the, the COVID stuff and um, the self-isolation and everything else, um, there was a, a very thorough discussion. Obviously, this is this is August. 
This is the month that uh, we traditionally handle all of our business. And there was a thorough discussion about what, if anything, we, we could, should do in regards to that. And I'll just be honest with you, we're at a point now where we're going to have just a moment of business here with those that are here and uh, uh, see what you think because the deacons don't have a, a very strong uh, uh, recommendation but they do have an, an option that they would like to uh, bring to you and just ask you what you think, how you feel and, and what you want to do moving forward. Um, and so I'm going to let Scott, uh, Scott share uh, what what they what they think, what they talk about, and what what's being presented to you as an option, and then we're just going to let the church have a have an opportunity to to express your desire and moving forward from here. So, appreciate that, Blue Mike. First, I apologize for the short notice because, like I say, it is, uh, it is a different time. But, um, and this, this talk just came up uh, Wednesday, Tuesday. So, I know it's short notice. You got all the numbers. Feedback. Oh, good. Okay. I always have that problem. Anyway. Uh, so, anyway, in an effort to be uh, right and fair, uh, we came up with this thought. So, and this is where we need y'all's participation. So, we knew when we had to cancel in-person worship and we were down for nearly three months that we were thrust into uncharted territory that this church and other churches have never seen. We knew decisions would have to be made as a church body that they may, they may have never been made before. We feel this may be one of those times. Due to the coronavirus, people have understandably resorted to self-isolation to avoid having any contact with people or the virus, and this has affected church participation. In light of these facts, leadership desiring to have as many voices heard as possible, as many voices heard as possible, are seeking your input on postponing our annual August business to November in hopes that the coronavirus cases are down and participation is up. We ask by show of hands for approval for this idea. If you agree, please, when asked, raise your hand. But based on precedent, we believe that this requires a two-thirds affirmative vote of those present in order to move forward in this direction. With that affirmation, all business to include budget, committees, and any other positions terms will be expended, extended to, to continue as is for the duration of, the approved, of this approved time. So, thank you. All right, so I want to make sure everybody's clear. Nobody's married to this. Nobody's strongly opinionated on this. Nobody should walk out of here mad about this. Nobody should be ready to fight about this. Deacons aren't coming and trying to push this down anybody's throat. They don't have any kind of agenda. There is absolutely nothing here other than saying, and we're at a different time right now, is, is this something that y'all want to do is to wait maybe until November and see if participation, church participation is up and and uh, give give it an opportunity. Okay, so uh, did everybody understand what he said to you? What's being asked? Did everybody understand what's being asked? Everybody clear? Are there any questions? If you got a question, ask it now. Any questions? So we're talking about deacons, trustees. Everything that we normally do in August. Deacons, tr both trustees, deacons, nominating and budget. Okay. All moving to November. And, and basically, uh, what's in place right now as far as, especially the budget, would just carry over until then. Would be the approval on, on if we do this. What we've done for this past year, we just keep, keep operating. Everybody clear? Everybody good? Nobody's mad about a no vote. If you don't want to do that, if you say, no, I want to do it this month, then raise your hand when it when, or don't raise your hand for yes. Okay, if you want to wait till November, then you're going to raise your hand. Everybody clear? Raising your hand means, yeah, let's not do it now. Let's wait till November and, and see if Corona's kind of let up and if participation is better. Everybody good? Clear? 
We good? All right. I'm looking for hands. I mean, for heads. All right. You ready? You ready? Yep. All right. Everybody that would agree. Now, now, look, this ain't one of them when I ask questions and everybody does this for me. This ain't one of them moments. All right. I'm going to need to be able to see. We've got to see hands in order for us to make sure that this is that two thirds majority that we talked about and all that good stuff. So, when, if you're going to vote, vote, vote. All right. Everybody in favor of holding off until November with our business, uh, signify that by the raising of your hand that you would like to hold off on your business. Keep them up just a moment. Let me look around. All right. Just count the room for me. I did. Good. Yeah. Got a room count. Mm -hmm. That's what we All right. Very good. I appreciate it. Um, I hope everybody is 100% on board with the spirit that was behind that. I promise you the heart that was.